Fannie Willis fails to quash those subpoenas. She did not want to testify in Scott McAfee's courtroom, the judge in the RICO case, but she's got to be on call because the subpoena is still in effect. We're going to go into the hearing and see exactly what happened, but this is the order that Scott McAfee, the judge, released notifying all of the people that there is a hearing on the motions to quash. Fannie does not want to testify, so her team submitted a motion to quash Robin Yurti. Don't want her to come and testify. She was a former employee of Fannie's office. We also have a motion to quash Nathan Wade. Do not want him, the special counsel, to come and testify. And lastly, of course, the motion to quash the FCDA, the Fulton County District Attorney. Fannie does not want to testify, but she might have to. Judge McAfee said that the hearing is on, and we're going to jump right into the court proceedings that happened today. Now, what we're going to do as we play through this is hit the highlights on this, but we're also going to hear some initial arguments from Ashley Merchant and then of course from this woman Anna Cross. Anna Cross you see here on your screen is one of the attorneys from Fulton County who has been hired to uh, deal with a lot of this litigation. So we're going to hear from her and others including Ashley Merchant who you can see kind of tucked back here right in this this screen this box right here. Ashley Merchant is in the pink. You can also see her in this screen as well. Scott McAfee is going to pick us up and he is going to explain what we're doing here. Backdrop is an evidence evidentiary hearing is coming up in just a few days. Fanny is racing to not testify. So they're trying to stop her and Nathan and Yurdy from having to testify. Judge McAfee says, sorry, hearing's on. And here's what it sounds like. Really right for review. The next issue, I think a little more, a little more to cover here. Again, just to set the stage of where we're at and I'll allow counsel to weigh in when we get to it, but just want to make my initial observations and findings of where we're going today and the rest of this week. So several of the motions to quash today are arguing that we shouldn't have evidentiary hearing at all and that quash is appropriate on those grounds. So to that end, it's setting the law that's been filed up to this point, I think it's clear that disqualification can occur if evidence is produced demonstrating an actual conflict or the appearance of one. And the filings submitted on this issue so far have presented a conflict in the evidence that can't be resolved as a matter of law. Okay, so that is the judge saying there is problem here. The law says I might be able to disqualify her. So I have to hear this in order to make a decision. I cannot just allow this to go forward without sitting here. Specifically looking at defendant Roman's motion, it alleges a personal relationship that resulted in a financial benefit to the district attorney. And that is no longer a matter of complete speculation. Yep. The state has admitted a relationship existed. And so what remains to be proven is the existence and extent of any financial benefit, again, if there even was one. So because I think it's possible that the facts alleged by the defendant could result in disqualification, I think an evidentiary hearing must occur to Ooh. establish the record on those core allegations. Yes, good call, Judge. So just to emphasize, I think the issues at point here are whether a relationship existed, whether that relationship was romantic or non-romantic in nature, when it formed and whether it continues. And that's only relevant because it's in combination with the question of the existence and extent of any personal benefit conveyed as a result of their relationship. With that being said, I don't think that means that everything that has been raised in the defendant's motions and Mr. Roman's or in the ones adopted by co-counsel demand an evidentiary hearing. The testimony that would be produced at this hearing is not a deposition and is still subject to the rules of evidence. And so I think the facts that are going to be developed on the record have to have some relevance and some materiality. Now, contradictions or how things play out could impact that, could change what is relevant. But at the outset, there are a few things that I don't think are. So to that end, I don't think the particulars of Mr. Wade's experience are relevant. Okay, so pausing, the judge says, we're having a hearing. We need to have a hearing. There's a bunch of stuff that is a problem. And we're asking about the extent of the damage, essentially. But there's a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to care about. So we're having the hearing, but we're only talking about some things. Some things we're not talking about are Nathan Wade's experience. I don't think those are material for an evidentiary hearing. His alleged lack of experience handling RICO cases or any inferences regarding the intent from that can be addressed at argument. But in my mind, as long as a lawyer has a heartbeat and a bar card, that lawyer's appointment standing alone is a matter within the district attorney's discretion. So don't uh, similarly, I haven't found a reason to find that the uh, regulations or the alleged violations of Fulton County Code are relevant in and of themselves. That's fine too. I think the violations of these rules can be argued as a matter of law if counsel wish to do that. But I've yet to see case law those or are, those are small, anything indicating that these issues. violations, if they did occur, are relevant to disqualification or a pending criminal case. And then finally, the motions have also evolved to include forensic misconduct on behalf of the district attorney. And again, I don't see how these are a necessary topic for an evidentiary hearing unless it's made an issue in some way. The public statements in my mind speak for themselves and the application of the law to those statements can be argued. And I don't think any further testimony qualifying them is going to affect the analysis. So with that being said- So we're going to have a hearing. I'm going to keep it narrowly circumscribed. Some things we'll talk about, some things we won't. Just letting you know, giving you a heads up. Ed, I'll turn it over, Mr. Merchant to you just 
at the outset. If you have anything you want to preserve for the record or to reply on, and then from there we can take up the motions one by one. No, Judge, we appreciate that narrowing issues, and we did plan on being narrow in the evidentiary evidentiary issues that we were going to be litigating on Friday. As far as as those topics, like you said, I think all of those things are already in record, so we're just planning on arguing those as far as the law. But the evidence, we'll get into a little bit deeper with the motions to quash. All right, thank you, Judge. Okay, so let's turn. I didn't really have an idea of the particular order, unless anyone's jumping up and down and says they have another conflict they need to get to. Why don't we start in the order that I received them? So I think the first one we got would have been from Ms. Cross on behalf of the district attorney. And Ms. Cross, the floor is yours. All right. That's Anna Cross, one of the attorneys that was hired by Fannie Willis to work this case. Now she's arguing why Fannie Willis's motion should be quashed, right? Starting with Fannie, the big one. Thank you, Judge McAfee. And I appreciate the, the narrowing of the issues. I think the state's motions to quash all relate to the areas that you consider to be available and open. So would be potentially still be the subject of any evidentiary hearing held this week. I think from the state's perspective, and as the court is aware, Ms. Merchant has subpoenaed a total of nine employees of the district attorney's office, oh, yeah. including the district attorney herself. Those range from the opposing counsel on the prosecution team prosecuting Mr. Defendant Roman. Sorry. Current and former members of that team includes individuals who have no direct relation with the prosecution, but also no relevant information, including the district attorney's personal executive assistant, members of her security detail, Get and other individuals who are employed by the office and quite outside the Perfect. area that the court has determined to be of relevance in a future evidentiary hearing. The state's position is, and I think the evidence is clear that these witnesses who Ms. Merchant or no opposing counsel has ever spoken to cannot be in good faith represented to the court as having information that would be relevant to any of the individual issues that the court has identified to being of interest. These witnesses, again, have never been spoken to and nor Ms. Merchant nor anyone else can represent what they would say. I will represent, however, what they would say. They would not in any way support the wild speculation that was included so why we in have this a motion. Hearing? Why we it have would a not support, as was raised in the reply brief that was filed this morning, Ms. Merchant represented that these witnesses subpoenaed, I think two weeks ago now, prior to the filing of Mr. Wade's affidavit, that any of these witnesses would refute the allegations or the representations that were made in the Wade affidavit. The allegations and the speculation from Mr. Roman's initial motion has been, I think, is clear to the court now. There have been several representations that were made that were not true, were not in good faith, could not be supported. These witnesses that have been subpoenaed now for a hearing this afternoon have nothing at all to add to the allegations that were made, nothing in support, Fanny, nothing that Nathan, would undermine the affirmations that were made in the Wade affidavit. Yurdy used to work there. The affirmations and the facts sworn by an officer of the court that were made were are categorically true. They're 100% true. And there's no witness, certainly none of the nine that were subpoenaed that are representative of the district attorney's office that will say otherwise. We pointed out to the court all of the law that disfavors defendant or any litigant subpoenaing opposing counsel or members yeah, of the yeah, yeah. opposing counsel's litigation team. Yeah, yeah. We a criminal know. defendant does not have the right to make claims without admissible evidence and then subpoena the other side in an effort to conjure up some evidence to support them. She's right. Like, it's not a good practice to subpoena each other's lawyers. Like, that's not like favored in law, you know, because it would be bedlam if everybody did that. But this is not a normal case. This is a serious case where there's major allegations of improprieties, conflicts of interest and bias amongst your side. That's not serious. That's an abuse of the subpoena power. No, it's not. It's the defendant's burden now that the motion to quash has been filed to establish the relevancy. And the state believes that there's just no way to make that claim in good faith, given the record that's before the court now. I don't, let me phrase it this way. This is a serious case. That's true. These are serious charges. That's true. Your Honor has been running a serious courtroom. Yep, that's true. And in response to the accusations that were made, the state presented the court with the uh, law that establishes that even if all of the allegations were true, and they're not, that is not a basis to either dismiss the indictment or disqualify the district attorney's office. The state has brought you the law. The state has brought you facts in the form of a sworn affidavit from the officer of the court, identifying the timeline of the relationship, the facts as it relates to any financial involvement related to the allegations that were made. There is no personal interest on behalf of the district attorney yes, or her office is. in the prosecution of she this defendant. On and there is no cruises. financial interest Every in two the months. prosecution or conviction of this defendant by the district attorney's office. The travel that was taken as represented in the affidavit was roughly equally divided between the two of them in terms of responsibility. Not on and those And there's no evidence that, that can read. be brought that would dispute that. These are serious charges. The state has responded to them seriously. And I think the court's action here will be informed by the other motions to quash that you'll hear this afternoon. My understanding is that of all of the witnesses subpoenaed, there will be no individual who has relevant information that would dispute the affirmations in the Wade indictment. The defense is not bringing you facts. The defense is not bringing you law. The defense is bringing you gossip. No. And the state cannot, and the court should not, condone that practice. I understand the court's representation, or I understand the court's position that an evidentiary hearing is required. If that is required, none of the witnesses identified here in the state's motion are properly subject to subpoena. And so that's addressing the employees of the district attorney's office and the district attorney. The state also filed a motion to quash the subpoena to Mr. Bradley, I believe is his name. Mr. Bradley is someone who was a 
former business partner of Mr. Wade. He was also his attorney related to divorce and domestic matters. And that relationship began in 2015. 2015 far predates any allegation relevant to the motion. That attorney-client representation continued through and including, I believe, 2022. There is has been no waiver of privilege of that. And I believe that the evidence or the record before the court would demonstrate that defense counsel knows that this relationship, attorney-client relationship exists, that she knows there will be a privilege invoked, and that it just is designed to obtain more public relations, more spectacle, and that the subpoena to Mr. Bradley should likewise be quashed. Okay, so reading between the lines, what she's saying, I think, is that Bradley's going to come in, and we read in the prior segment the entire filing, the supplemental filing, where Bradley is this key witness. Bradley is a Wade law partner, ex-law partner, who's going to come in and apparently have information about these two indicting each other, Nathan and Fanny, a long time ago, right, before she even hired him. So there was some sort of funny business, Fanny business happening between the two. But he is brought in, and she's saying that he's going to invoke, right? He's going to say, nope, attorney-client privilege, and then not say anything, right? Like not actually reveal the goods, not actually provide any of that data. What Ashley Merchant is going to very likely come out and argue in a minute is that it's separate, right? There's bro talk and there's attorney talk. And they were bros before they were attorneys. And they were doing bro talk about the relationship before they actually formalized the relationship. And then whatever happened in the actual divorce from Jocelyn shifted into attorney-client privilege stuff. And so the previous stuff doesn't count. I believe Mr. Evans, if he's here now, will address in more detail the bank records. But given the court's representation, I, I won't go into that, I believe, if that was included. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But insofar as the subpoena is has been issued for the bank records of Mr. Wade and his law practice personally and other entities associated with him, that's clearly a fishing expedition that the law does not permit. Yes, the court to quash that is overbroad and harassing. All right. I think there's a lot to take up there. Ms. Merchant, I want to let you respond generally. Maybe we'll descend into the particulars afterward. Judge, a couple things on the state's argument to quash, Judge. First, I'd just like to point out the state is asking that this sworn affidavit from an officer of the court, from Mr. Wade, be considered. But when we were in federal court, Ms. Cross argued that an affidavit is not admissible. We don't believe an affidavit is admissible in this case. You can cherry pick an affidavit, what you want to talk about, and there's no cross-examination. So that, it's not admissible. We yeah. put that in our brief. We've argued that. It's yeah. just not Wade's, admissible. It's not relevant. It's Wade's hearsay. Affidavit. It's nothing more than hearsay. We have a right to make a record on these allegations. And as long as we keep our evidence and our questions narrowly tailored to that inquiry, that is our right. We have a right to explore whether or not there was a personal or financial benefit to Miss Willis from this relationship. And we have carefully chosen the witnesses that we have subpoenaed based on that. And I just want to walk through a couple of them. But before I move on on the affidavit issue, Mr. Wade has filed other affidavits in his divorce case, which contradict this affidavit. His interrogatories, which were sworn and verified and filed in that case, said that he did not have a personal relationship, that there had been none. So we've got two declarations in two different courts, both sworn, both filed with the court that say something completely different. His May, let's see, it was his May 2023 affidavit, where he was asked if he had, and this was in 2023, Judge. So the state's response last, last week said they had a relationship that began in 2022. In May of 2023, he filed in the Cobb County Superior Court a pleading that said specifically if he had had any relations with a person other than his spouse during the course of the marriage, you know, and, and the typical things that are asked in a divorce case. And he responded none. After we filed our motion in this case, <laughs> he updated those uh, and he pled privilege under the Fifth Amendment. Oh, so busted. we've got a filing <laughs> under oath by Mr. Wade in 2023 stating he didn't have a relationship. Weird. Then we've got a filing stating he did have one starting in 2022. Weird, weird. And then once that came about, he fixes the incorrect affidavit that was filed back in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> the, the dude can't even get his story straight. And then now he starts to plead the fifth, which if you're a judge, man, and a lawyer lied to you in your courtroom, they said an affidavit. I did not have, you know, any relationships with that woman, like a Clinton type of deal, which is what Wade did. And now you have a, a competing interrogatory, which is, you know, these are like interviews type questions that you get in other proceedings, civil proceedings. And so he has opposite answers in two different courts in the same state. That's weird. You're a lawyer. You're supposed to be honest and have, you know, candor with the court. These are in the rules. So amazing. She called him out on that. And that is a big, I mean, gosh, if you're the judge, you're like, what is this dude doing? He's just in big trouble. So he could, of course, still come back with the, it depends on what the definition of is, is defense. I can still see this from Nathan Wade and Fanny. Again, they're just indictments. It's not a romantic relationship. So what if we did the hibbity dibbity at the old judicial conference? Who cares? That has nothing to do with anything. You know, I'm not in, we're not in a relationship. It's not a romantic relationship. It's just indictments. So maybe you can get away with that. Okay. But you know, that only 
only works for Democrats and Bill Clinton. That doesn't work in most courts of law. It's like, come on, were you indicting her or not? You knew you were, and you made two different statements because you were trying to hide the fact and you were covering it up. That is like, look, you can understand uh, you get carried away. The heart is, you know, you can't fight love, my friends, you know. And so, okay, they make a mistake. They get in trouble. They resign. They call it a day or whatever, but they're digging their heels in on this and they keep just adding layers to their excuse and they keep getting busted in the result in the aftermath. So we definitely have a conflict, Judge, in the evidence as far as when this relationship started. I mean, just from the hearsay affidavit. From his own conflict, statements Judge. from Nathan Wade himself. There's also some other things in the Wade affidavit that we have conflicts in. We've got the date. We've got whether or not they cohabitated, whether or not there were any funds that he was paid, that he used for travel with Miss Willis. We have quite a few documentations that we have attached to filings, and we have more that we intend to present <laughs> at the hearing in this case to show that she did receive a lot of benefit, a lot of financial benefit. Ashley's going to come in with a friggin' wheelbarrow of, you know, manila file folders, and she's going to dump them on the courtroom floor. Here you go. In the forms of different trips, plane tickets, hotel rooms, Ubers, dinners, things like that. We have all of those from the financial records, which I'll, I'll go into in just a minute to stay on task. Go into those in just a minute. But that's as far as Wade. Why we think that Wade definitely should be called as a witness in this case. How can Mr. Wade not have relevant information yeah. to this inquiry? He was doing that indicting. is the real question here. He probably has the most relevant information to yeah. this inquiry. Nathan Tucker. Same as Miss Willis. She probably has the most relevant information well, to this inquiry. Yeah, she's the guy. Mr. Bradley, the state has taken it upon themselves to file a motion to quash Mr. Bradley's subpoena. Mr. Bradley has not filed a motion to quash. The divorce in this case was not filed until November 2021. The only privilege that can be asserted is things that were said in furtherance of legal advice. So if Mr. Wade made statements or comments to Mr. Bradley in furtherance of legal advice, we're not going into any of that. We don't have any intention of getting into a privilege dispute, what was privileged and what was not. The relevant information that Mr. Bradley has to this inquiry is that this relationship started prior to Mr. Wade being appointed as a special prosecutor in this case. He has firsthand knowledge that this relationship predated that. He has knowledge and not privileged knowledge, Judge. The divorce action hadn't even been filed at that point. He has personal knowledge, not privileged knowledge, that they had cohabitated, had stayed at the same place. And, you know, I certainly don't intend on getting into a, an argument over what the term cohabitated means. They had stayed together. He had, Mr. Wade had stayed at places that Fulton County was paying for Miss Willis to stay at. He's got information about that. We have outlined all that. We've made a proffer. That is not privileged information, Judge. And unlike some of the, I guess, other witnesses that are here challenging their subpoenas, I, my inference from the supplemental reply is that this is something that you have corresponded or communicated with Mr. Bradley about directly. Yes. Only non-privileged information. Yes, Judge. And that's an right. interesting question. And so, you know, is he going to come in? Because Anna said that Bradley's going to come in and basically invoke. It sounds like he's going to invoke. So it sounds like, you know, she's got a plan to get around that. Or maybe he's told her that he won't invoke. In other words, Bradley will say, yeah, I'll answer questions about anything that was not privileged. You know, so we might have a difference of opinion about what this witness is going to do when he is called in. And so let's put the district attorney and Mr. Wade in a separate category. I think he would still, now that the motion has been filed, need to make some kind of showing for the other seven witnesses challenged by the state. And judge, sometimes when we subpoena witnesses, if they would be fallback witnesses, for example, if Miss Willis is not, if you don't force Miss Willis to take the stand, then we would have to present witnesses to establish what Miss Willis could be questioned about. And so some of those witnesses would be cumulative of what Miss Willis testified, but they could be impeachment. It just depends. And so I'll go through all of those witnesses, judge, as far as our belief that they have personal information. How I sort of categorized them was we had Willis, Sonia Allen, and Dexter Bond, and then Daisha Young. All so people from Fulton County. Sonia Allen is the head of the anti-corruption unit. Okay. She's the one that essentially started these contracts for all of these anti-corruption contracts, which is where most of the outside counsel work in the DA's office is coming from. She has personal knowledge about the relationship between those parties, about the financial benefit, about the contracts. She's the one that is the head of the anti-corruption unit. And, you Sounds know, just, like just to focus in on whether or not we have to talk to a witness before we subpoena that witness, there's no law that says you have to talk to a witness before you subpoena them. And that makes sense. Police officers regularly do investigations and they talk to tons of witnesses. You talk to one witness and it leads you to another witness and you subpoena people who are not particularly willing to talk to you. I asked all of these people to talk to me. It's not surprising that they don't want to. They also all have NDAs. So they wow, have non-disclosure yeah. agreements that they've been asked to sign by the district attorney's office. And so they're hesitant. I'm not saying these in particular, but members of the district attorney staff are hesitant to talk because of that. But a court order such as a subpoena would go alleviate any of those concerns. So that recognizing that, even if you don't have to talk to them, I think you would still have to have some kind of good faith belief of what it is they could possibly say that is relevant or that you could later impeach them on that then becomes substantive evidence, right? Yeah, right. Low so 
what is it? Let's just start with Miss Allen. She okay. starts the anti-corruption unit. She may have been there at the formation of these contracts. But is there anything as part of that that you think plays into these issues? Just personal knowledge as to when the relationship started. These witnesses would all have personal knowledge as to when the relationship started. And when we say the relationship, are we referring to just the fact that they knew each other or that, knew that it changed or evolved? That it was the relationship predated Mr. Wade being hired as special counsel. And the romantic. what aspect of the relationship? That their relationship was romantic, Judge. I'm sorry. I should have been more specific. Sure. So these witnesses all have personal knowledge. And I've talked to a lot of different witnesses. And a lot of witnesses, you know, when you're investigating a case, some witness may not have personal knowledge, but they might know someone who does have personal knowledge, things like that. How do you know Miss Allen has personal knowledge of that? From Mr. Bradley. Okay. All right. And so okay. theoretically, if Miss Allen testified and it denied that, Mr. Bradley would be able to impeach her? Right. Yes, okay. Judge. All right. And the same with the other witnesses, Miss Young and Mr. Bond. The same argument. Nothing else to supplement that or to add? No, not for those, Judge. There's a couple other witnesses that we included. One of them is, so Robin Yurdy, who we'll get to in a minute, was Miss Willis's executive assistant. I subpoenaed her current executive assistant, which is Tia Green. That's her personal assistant who keeps her calendars, does all of her scheduling. All the vacation She can testify time. as yeah. to travel that they took together, spending, different information about spending, and then also the personal nature of the relationship. And then the all of the other folks are... Well, let's see, we're moving on. So that was Alan and Young. You'd lumped Bond into that same initial category. So what about him? Yes, I did. I'm sorry, Judge. I lumped Bond, Young, and Alan into that same... Basically, I lumped the lawyers, Willis, Young, Allen, Bond, and Wade all together as far as personal knowledge of when the relationship began. And although, again, just focusing on Allen, Bond, and Young, although you're saying you haven't, you don't personally have statements from them on the record or in some kind of documentary form, you're saying that if they deny knowledge, you have someone who can impeach that testimony. Yes, Judge. Wow. All right. Okay. Let's move on to the next category, if you've got one. Tia Green. That's the executive assistant. And I'm sorry, I jumped ahead on that argument. Miss Green is replaced Robin Yurdy, who is the former executive assistant, essentially does calendaring, keeps calendars, things like that, and can attest to when travel was made. Some of the things we've got, travel documents that we have to admit in other areas, but this would put Miss Willis with Mr. Wade on these trips. Busted. And again, is this, we don't know what Miss Green would say, right. so is it just the fact that she keeps the calendar that you assume she knows that she's going with Mr. Wade? Right. Well, that she knows that she keeps the calendar, she's her personal assistant, and so Miss Yurdy did that before, and Miss Green took over that job. Other than saying, you know, it's possible Miss Green could just be saying, yes, she was out of the office this week, and that's all I know about it. It's possible she could say that, yes, Judge. And do you have any evidence to suggest she knows more than that? Not specifically, no. And she has unfortunately not been willing to talk to me. Understood. So that seems that like there's less there for you to work with. There's definitely less there for me to work with, yes. What else do you think I gotta know about Miss Green then? The th with Miss Green, it's really so Miss Yurdy was the one who had this type of relationship before, and Miss Green took over that role, that personal assistant role. And my investigations revealed how Miss Yurdy knew all of the traveling arrangements, purchasing, things like that. And that's what led me to Miss Green. Okay. So just following the data, you have to follow the bouncing ball on the very specific bits of data. Okay. What does this person know? Why are they valid? Why should I hear from them? And so on. And so they're bouncing around right now, but remember there was a bunch of people they subpoenaed. And so they're continuing on. The other area, all of the other folks for the DA's office are people in security, essentially investigations and security. They are people who have served as the personal detail for Miss Willis. Be, uh, Hill, Green, and Ricks, right? Yes. Hill, Green, and Ricks. And those folks have served as Miss Willis's, she calls them the head of dignitary services. It's essentially the, the team that follows her around and takes her places. And they would be able to testify from the witnesses I've talked to, they would be able to testify about she and Nathan going to the safe house together, living at the safe house together, staying there regularly, things like that. Cohabitating essentially, which disputes what is in the affidavit. But I guess if you're referring to maybe a specific date or time frame, you don't know which of these three witnesses, if any of them might personally know about that time frame or could. I believe all three of them do. I okay. believe all three of them know about that. I've spoken with other people who were formerly on the dignitary services who did not do that and who identified who are the ones that actually would have that direct knowledge, actually did the transport of Miss Willis and Mr. Wade. And so if either of these individuals came and denied having any knowledge whatsoever, you have someone who could impeach them having made a prior statement explicitly on that point? Yes, I do. All right. What else? The only other issue for the district attorney's office was the bank records. I don't know if you wanted me to go ahead and go into that now or wait for Mr. Evans to talk about that. The state had... Right. No, I think we'd have to, we'd want to loop him in on that. But let me just, on this first issue, allow Ms. Cross to jump back in. And so Ms. Cross focusing... Right. So huge points there by Ms. Merchant and did a great job of really fleshing out all of the big issues that we need to talk about in this case. Going one by one through all of the various witnesses that they had subpoenaed. And of course, they're objecting to each one of those subpoenas, trying to stop really any testimony, including Nathan Wade and Fannie Willis. And so it sounds like the judge is 
hinting towards allowing them in, right? Allowing the subpoenas to be valid because she was able to articulate a reason, a rationale for each one of those individuals. And she did a great job. Very fun to watch that. Solely on whether defense counsel has made a good faith basis to show that the relevance of these witnesses, even though, you know, she may not have talked to him or they didn't want to talk to her. Why is Quashel still appropriate? Quashel is still appropriate here because even Miss Merchant's recitation to the court of the facts and circumstances of why these witnesses are relevant displays a misunderstanding of the role of these individuals and in particular the role of Miss Yerdy. Miss Yerdy was never part of the executive staff or team. Miss Yerdy was not someone who kept the district attorney's schedule or calendar. The allegations here are she worked on the media team was her role. The media team, not the executive staff or team or responsible for calendaring the district attorney's office. Just to be clear, I mean, your motion doesn't cover Ms. Yurdy. That's someone it else doesn't. here. But it, you're it saying doesn't. that impacts the argument towards Ms. Green? Okay. Correct. All right. Correct. And the other individuals, Ms. Merchant didn't make a representation to the court about how Mr. Bradley would know about the knowledge of Ms. Allen, Mr. Bond, and Ms. Young. That is, I think, relevant information if it's not admissible. Any impeachment evidence she has would not be admissible. Likewise, the security- Why wouldn't it be admissible? If Mr. Bradley heard that second or third hand that Ms. Allen knew this or Ms. Young was aware of that or Mr. Bond said this. Sure. That wasn't the impression I got. The impression I got, and we can correct this while we're all here together, is that they, Mr. Bradley directly overheard a statement from each of these individuals that they could be impeached with. Ms. Merchant, is that accurate? Directly overheard. Which ones are we talking about? Specifically? Well, essentially, that, that kind of seemed to be all of them. You had said Allen, Bond, Young, and then the investigators, Hill, Green, and Ricks, could all be directly impeached by statements overheard by Mr. Bradley. Yes. All right, Ms. Cross. Wow. Okay. So we're talking, you know, about hearsay. Anna is looking flustered right now. She's looking a little flustered. So Bradley is Wade's law partner, and apparently he's got direct inside source information about all of the other witnesses, right? So she was saying like direct one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, Bradley heard it from those other people. And so it's not hearsay, right? He heard it. He can come in and say, I heard that. And this is what happened. Now, Anna was saying, sorry, no, that he heard that stuff from other people saying Bradley is going to come in and say, I heard that from someone who told me that, but about that other person. But Merchant just came back up and said, no, direct all of them. We'll wow. be shocked. I'll be shocked. If Ms. We'll be shocked. We'll be shocked. If Ms. Merchant is able to support that statement. Shocked. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe even if it was true and it's not. And can I just say, when we're talking about the timeline and what might be relevant in an evidentiary hearing, I guess we could spend a lot of time talking about dates and timelines and who is responsible. But for the record, and should there be an evidentiary hearing, I understand the court's ruling, there's an evidentiary hearing. What the state will establish with unequivocally is that there was no cohabitation. District Attorney Willis and Nathan Wade never lived together, that the representations that have been made. To okay, so that's, you know, you got to be careful with that. Like lived together. Like, okay, they shacked up together. They went on cruises together. But like, what does living together mean? Like, did he have his bills go to her house or something? Like, is that the standard that they're, you know, we never bought a mortgage together. It's like, okay, we're not talking about that. Like, did you sleep over regularly? Was he there often together? Like, were you in and out of the same location on multiple nights in a row? Okay, that's living together, right? That's waking up, doing things together, living together. Maybe not permanently, but it's cohabitating at least, right? If that's the standard. So, and what she is hinting at, right? It sounds like to her, like this Bradley guy is, she makes it sound like it's a strong state witness, right? In other words, he's going to come out here, take the stand and deny everything or invoke, right? Plead the fifth or something. And you know, I don't know, maybe he's in sleeping with somebody too. Who knows? You know, I don't know what's going on. But the point is like, she thinks that he is not going to say what Ashley says. So maybe, you know, she heard something from Nathan Wade. Maybe he promised Wade, like, yeah, I got a subpoena, but I'm not going to say anything or something. You know, it's weird. Like you don't know what's happening behind the doors. To date are just demonstratively untrue. For example, the allegation is that they lived together in District Attorney Willis's home prior to District Attorney Willis's father living with her. And that when the father moved in, then Mr. Wade moved out. Of course, that is untrue. And the state would be able to establish that Mr. Floyd, District Attorney's father, moved in, even changed his Georgia driver's license prior to the time that the District Attorney and Mr. Wade ever met. That the testimony from Mr. Floyd would be that he lived there continuously and never saw Mr. Wade there. Mm. The evidence would be that the timeline that's being represented is either mistaken, if that's charitably, or simply fabricated. So I just want the court to understand that this is a hearing that we're contemplating, and I understand the rulings. But to return to your question about Ms. Allen, Mr. Bond, and Ms. Young, I believe that the spectacle of calling opposing counsel in this case deny that they have any knowledge about a relationship because they didn't have any knowledge about a relationship, and certainly none that contradicts the Wade affidavit. Calling them in to say that, and then another individual to say, no, I heard otherwise, appears to have very little evidentiary value. I would put it that way. Even if the good faith basis that Ms. Merchant represents has very little evidentiary value. Insofar as the security staff was referenced and mentioned, again, I don't believe that there is a good faith basis to believe for any witness to say that the two cohabitated, they never did so. I don't believe there's a good faith basis for any witness to say that there was a relationship prior to 2022 as was represented in the affidavit. These
these witnesses who have a host of other security sensitive information about the district attorney and her travels and her arrangements and the means by which she that. is kept safe Don't under the constant that. threat um, that I think we all recognize is there, that there is no good faith basis to believe that they have any information. Again, she's never spoken to anyone. And I didn't hear a representation that anyone could impeach those witnesses with testimony that they said otherwise. So I think those are properly quashed even without further inquiry. In that last bit, you're referring to the investigators? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, again, I think that's what Ms. Merchant is, is putting out here, that her star witness, Mr. Bradley, is able to impeach every one of them. Is that? I didn't hear the representation that Ms. Merchant said that Mr. Bradley told her that he could, he has personal knowledge that investigators Hill, Green, and Ricks had knowledge of a cohabitation or a personal relationship prior to 2022. Maybe I missed it. It depends on your definition, Judge, of cohabitation, that they stayed at the same house together, slept at the same house. Yes, that they have knowledge of that. And again, knowledge based on statements that they made to someone else who you do have under subpoena and will, will you would intend to have testified the hearing. Yes. And right. just, just for background, when DA Willis took office, Mr. Bradley had a contract. So did Mr. Campbell. They all had contracts. The whole firm, there were three partners. It was Bradley, Wade, Campbell, three person firm. They all three had contracts to work at the DA's office. So they're all working at the DA's office in some capacity. Two of them had these taint contracts. So Bradley had, he had two contracts, actually. He had a first appearance contract. A lot of taint so did Mr. Campbell. Georgia. And Mr. Bradley and Mr. Campbell also had these taint attorney contracts where they're working directly for the anti-corruption unit. So it's not just this lawyer that he's partners with out in Cobb County. They're all together. They're all intimately well, well, together. I mean, that's good by way of background, but really, I just think just to get through over that threshold today, and Ms. Cross, I'll let you have the last word here, but I don't know how many times, you know, or you may have argued at a closing the pattern instruction that a single witness, if believed, can establish a fact. What I'm hearing is, again, emphasizing the conflict in the evidence. And if the state is, it sounds quite confident that it's going to have an abundance of evidence to show yeah. these things are not true. They She's got evidence to show the opposite. So it sounds like you got a lot of stuff. You've got this guy, this witness, dad's going to come in and say that's not true. And mom's going to come in. All these people come in. Okay. But it sounds like there's a conflict. So we actually have to have a hearing to debate those things. Hearing, but I don't see how I can make that determination on the front end without live testimony subject to cross-examination and an assessment of demeanor and everything else that Yikes. goes into those kind of determinations. I don't see a way around that. Any final thoughts for me? Only, Your Honor, that I'd ask the court to hold or reserve ruling on the state's motion to quash until Mr. Bradley, who appears to be the sole and primary source for the allegations that have been made, until he testifies at a hearing. And then if you're not otherwise inclined to quash the subpoenas, that they be revisited at that time. All right. I think that is appropriate. So to that end, one thing I would I would share is that obviously, as we've talked about, the rules of evidence would apply, but this is much more so than I would do in front of a jury. I plan to be proactive about the application of 403 and 611. And so if there's anything that's cumulative, if there's anything that referring to, as in the words of the rule, harassment or undue embarrassment, I'm not going to feel inhibited from stepping in, even without an objection from counsel to move this along and keep it focused on the issues at hand. So to that end, I do think that, again, under, under the court's authority to control the order and manner of presentation of the evidence, it would be important that from the outset, we're not talking about calling Ms. Willis as the first witness, and we need to get over a few procedural hurdles before we can get there. So I agree with Ms. Cross on that point. So, however, when it comes to the issue at hand, I think Ms. Merchant has established a good basis for relevance, and I don't see how Quashel can... Ooh can be imposed here. Fanny, your subpoena is still active. Get your butt ready for court on Thursday. Hopefully you and Nathan have a nice Valentine's Day steak planned out. You're going to need your energy. So that's the judge saying, look, I'm not quashing Fanny's subpoena. Okay. There's a lot of problems that I just heard about in this case. And it sounds like Ashley's going to at least be able to get us over the hurdle, but Fanny doesn't have to go first. Fanny can go second or whenever the appropriate timing is, but they're going to start off laying foundation, right? They're going to bring in Bradley. He's going to come in and say, yes, I I can point to this. Yes, I can point to this. I have personal knowledge. It's not hearsay. It's all relevant, right? Whatever. It's all material. And then once he starts, you know, pointing out certain people, then they can call them in. So Fanny's going to be on a hot standby, ready to come in and testify. And they are not happy about that. Woo! I think it's a closer call with Miss Green. That may yet result in Quashel, but at this point, with each one of these witnesses, would defer the ruling until we get further into the hearing itself. All right. Anything else, Miss Cross? I know you had also talked about the bank records. And as it relates to the privilege issues with Mr. Bradley, I think those just need to be handled as the questions are put to him. And if it needs to go into an in-camera session, we can do that. But it sounds like Ms. Merchant is aware of that issue. We would need to establish when and how and the scope of his representation of Mr. Wade. And we could proceed very carefully to make sure that issues of privilege are not gone into. Thank you, Your Honor. We, of course, you know, Mr. Evans will speak to the bank records insofar as there is a privilege. Again, Mr. Wade does not waive any portion of it. And if that could be a conversation that takes place in chambers as opposed to in open court, I think that would be beneficial for everyone. All right. I'm sure. Let me turn then to Mr. Yeah. Evans. I think it did join us by Zoom now. And can you hear me, Your Honor? I can, there's a bit of an echo. Give us a few more. Say something else, Andrew. You're frozen. Is that better? That's much better. All right. So having reviewed your motion to quash and the reply and with the benefit of what you've just heard before, my remaining concern deals with scope and overbreadth. I think the subpoena is pretty broad there. So 
maybe we could start start with that, Mr. Evans. Anything else you'd like to add? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. The scope is not just overly broad, it's limitless. It requests any and all documents in Synovus Bank's possession related to Nathan J. Wade, at PC and or Wade Bradley and Campbell Law Firm. So there's no dates given, no scope is provided, no reason requesting these documents is mentioned, and no connection to the criminal charges against Roman is cited. So you mentioned a reply. I have not seen any reply file. Oh, well, um, you missed so it. You missed it. It was really good. We just read it in the prior segment. It says that your client is a liar. I didn't file one on his. Okay. I suppose it didn't relate to your specific motion to quash. Let me, but let me just start right there. There's no date range whatsoever in this, Ms. Merchant. Why is that not quash? I'll just on itself. Judge, it's, and if there's no date range, then it, we were supposed to have certain records. So I've already received most of the bank record. I need a business record certificate, which is what I sent with the subpoena, because I cannot admit those records at a hearing without that business record certificate. I also, the records I have end in November, I believe, they're voluminous. And I wanted to be able to do a summary under 1006 for the court. I agree. I don't want to go into tons of bank records. I don't think, you know, 98% of them aren't relevant, but 2% are. Um, and so in order to get them into evidence, I've got to have a business record certificate. I had to subpoena the banks to get that business record certificate. I've got a business record certificate that was filed in the divorce case, but I don't have one for this case. So, and the one that was filed in the divorce or the one that was received in the divorce case, I believe ended in November, those records. So that's why we need these. So the only thing you're after still, you're saying is for Sonova's bank to have signed a certification. Yes, sir. All right. So just a kind of a sub issue here. What authority do you have that someone can be subpoenaed and forced to authenticate a document? They can't be forced to authenticate the documents so that they authenticated in the Cobb County case. And it's or even the ones they produced. Well, they haven't produced any in response to this, right? No, they have not. You're saying you've got what you need already from the Cobb County case. Right. And you need a further record certification for, for what exactly? So I have the records that were submitted under the business record certificate in the Cobb County case. That's a civil case, so it's a little bit different rules, but not major different rules because of business records. So I've got that business record certificate. They certified those records. I've got that. But I wanted one for All this right. case, a business record certificate for this case. So that oh, I just, could... You just want a different case number on the business record certificate. Well, it's the same records. I mean, I did not anticipate this would be a big deal. But why do they need a different case number? Why wouldn't a business record certification for another case apply in this one? I was just being overly cautious to try and get it because I anticipated an objection to that because they were certified in that case. If there's okay. no issue with that, then I've got the business record certificate. Well, I'm not going to, I won't rule on it proactively unless I'd see whether there's an objection from the other side and what argument they have on it. And that would be up to the state. But to the original point, even if you've subpoenaed someone for a business record certification, is that an appropriate use of a subpoena? It, well, I would bring them here to get the records because right. if I don't have the business record certificate, then okay. they have to take a stand and I get them in sure. that way. So, so that's why I subpoenaed them. So they are, the bank itself is a person has acknowledged subpoena from the service, excuse me, from the bank. Yes. I talked with the bank. The bank actually has a lawyer and they don't want to come to court. They want to submit a business record certificate. Right. And I don't have any problem with that. Like I told them, I just need that in advance of the hearing so I can put the state on notice of All right, Mr. Evans, having seen that the scope of your motion to quash is very much a more narrow focus than perhaps we thought. Any reaction? Well, Synovus refused to produce the records pending the motion to quash. So I don't know about all the, I mean, they haven't agreed to, to produce anything, but what is the purpose of trying to get the personal and law firm bank records? What is the goal here? Well, I'll let them answer it. But one reason is because they said that they split bills, right? That they split costs. And we have a lot of questions about that. We don't think that they did. We think that they're liars in their filings. Like sure. that's, that's part of what was overly broad about that. There's no dates, not just that there's no scope, but there's no connection to the underlying crimes charged against Roman, neither alleged nor could there be. What are we hoping to even discover here? Number one, Has this dude how would that be anything? relevant? Number two, and just what is the general purpose of all this? I mean, keep, keep in mind, this subpoena went to Synovus. It never went to my client. Ms. Merchant hid it from my client. We only knew about this because Synovus properly and timely alerted us of the subpoena. So all of this was meant to be kept outside of our knowledge. So it, it's done in secret. It's done in a way that has no limit whatsoever it's a defense on it. Investigation. It's done with no reason mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the goal here? Sure. Okay, Mr. Evans. And so I'm clear, the subpoena is, is not just the law firm records. It's also Mr. Wade's personal bank account records. Is that right, Ms. Merchant? Personal bank account records at Synovus. It's law firm records. Okay. So other than maybe showing or proving how much money the law firm received as a result of the representation, why do we need these? It's not that. He actually paid for most of the trips out of the Yeah, it's firm. trips. So that's why. He paid for personal trips that he and Ms. Willis took. Out of his firm. law firm. And, and there's quite a few different bank accounts, which is why I don't mean <laughs> to sound vague. It's just there's a couple different bank accounts and I have all of the bank records and we put a lot of that in our motion, our response, so the court would have some specifics as to the money that was spent. But essentially, the money is being spent on Miss Willis. Some of the money is being spent on Miss Willis. Not and so it's relevant to show that she has a personal <laughs> or financial interest, which is the entire issue of disqualification. So the hearing that we subpoenaed these records for has nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of Mr. Roman. Yeah, well, Evans, to address that. Okay. Evans just got blown out of the water. What the heck kind of question? He's like, why are we here? What does Nathan Wade's records have to do with Mike Roman's guilt? You're like, dude, do you know what hearing you're at? This is not a trial. This is an evidentiary hearing on a motion
motion to dismiss and disqualify. So not good. Okay. But I guess going back to the core point here, the subpoena that issue did not have any limitation on time. And Judge, I apologize. I already had the records. And so I wanted them to certify the records. I did not anticipate it would be an issue like this. And so I, normally when you serve a subpoena like that, they would contact us, and which they did. And I actually reached out to them to try and narrow this issue. I didn't mean to hide the ball on the dates or anything like that. Like it's the records we have that I wanted certified. Well, I think the we can't amend it after the fact. And so you can try to reserve it, I suppose, before Thursday. But the subpoena in front of me, I think, uh, goes too far. And or you can try to use the record certification you have elsewhere if you think that's, that's legal. That's what I can just do that, Judge. And we did file the returns. So, I mean, we're not trying to hide anything. Sure. Uh, the returns. That's, I believe, how they got them. All right, Mr. Evans. So I'm granting your motion. Anything else you think we need to address on your behalf? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. So he's actually successful. He doesn't even read anything. He just goes in there and says, well, she says, I'll try to get it in another way. I already have the business certificate. And, you know, this type of stuff is necessary in order to get records admitted into evidence. You have to, you can't just come up with like a bunch of printed out documents, right? And say, here, these are legitimate. What's the foundation? Are they accurate? Are they authenticated? And so when you slap a business certificate on there, you say, okay, these are records that are kept in the ordinary course of business because they're part of a business. Here's the business certificate. And so it's just some procedural stuff that she's got to hash through. And so I'm sure she'll figure it out. Joining us. I am judge. Good afternoon. All right. Good afternoon, sir. Any particular order you want to go in? I can address mine first, judge. I mean, I'm sure the court has read the pleading. Miss Merchant actually filed a response in my pleading as it concerns my motion to quash. You know, of course, I represent it that I have no personal or direct knowledge concerning the issues that are germane to this court or that are pending before this court. I mean, taking a, a glance at what the court has already discussed with, with Ms. Cross in the state's motion, I would submit that, I mean, I mean, if she's saying that I have relevant information and that at some point she has a witness to reflect that I have direct or indirect knowledge concerning the issues that are germane to, to this court, then, you know, I guess we just have to wait and see. I would submit to this court, however, that I don't. And I mean, it is a fishing, fishing expedition as it concerns me. I mean, I guess arguably if she wanted to question me about whether I was considered to be the special prosecutor, that certainly would be relevant. But based upon my lack of knowledge concerning any romantic relationship prior to her motions and the issues brought out before this court, I have no direct or indirect knowledge. And so I do think it's a fishing expedition. And of course, if she wants to respond and suggest that she has a witness that will contradict that evidence, then so be it. We can just deal with it at that time. Okay. And I'd, I'd note, Ms. Merchant, that if it's solely to say that he was considered to be special assistant, that that's going to go more into the qualifications area that I don't see as germane and necessary for an evidentiary hearing. But over to you. I think what Mr. Ranks was kind of suggesting was that he sort of be like in waiting, you know, like sort of backup. And that's what I planned on for him anyway, um, as far as some of Mr. Bradley's testimony. Sure. But I'd also like he has other clients and other obligations. And if there's really nothing of relevance, then I think we need to at least have some kind of, as we did with the other witnesses, an initial upfront showing of that. So as we walked through just at a surface level with the district attorney employees, what is it that Mr. Banks you think is going to testify to that, that you're going to be either able to, he's going to go along with you or that you're going to be able to impeach? It depends on what, how they impeach Mr. Bradley. So there's some areas that they may question Mr. Bradley about. And Mr. Bradley has received phone calls um, from some people over the last several months trying to promote him not to testify. Wow. So I don't know what the state plans on going into. Wow. Um, mm. Wow. That's spicy. So Bradley might testify to say that he's got a bunch of people calling him to say, don't testify at the hearing. Who may have called him? Could it be Gabe down there? Well, and I can Cold as ice. appreciate the need not to want to have to present your entire case today. But at the same time, I think we may need some more specifics. And if that has to be in camera, then we can do that. I mean, it's just Mr. Bradley has received calls that he believed were trying to keep him from testifying. Ooh. All right. And those calls would be relevant and admissible how? It depends on if he is cross-examined about it, but it's also his fear in testifying. I mean, that's something that the state regularly asks witnesses if they want to be there to testify, you know, to the veracity for the court. Wow. You know, he's not, he doesn't want to be part of this. He doesn't want to come and take the stand. And so I think when he goes into that, it'll be relevant to the court. Is your contention that Mr. Banks made some of these calls? Great yes. question. All right. The question okay. is yes. Mr. Banks, back to, uh, Mr. Banks made some of these calls? Yes. Oh! Okay, Mr. Banks, back to you. Banks! I mean, to the extent that I had conversations with Mr. Bradley about it, I mean, there's certainly conversations that I had. I called him, and I'm happy to talk about it, but I called him on a personal level because, one, he's my friend, and two, he's my fraternity <laughs> brother. And I know that ultimately these type of things are very stressful. I was concerned ultimately wow. about him being emotional given his prior relationship with Mr. Wade of not being able to see the forest behind the trees when you actually are making decisions on an emotional basis. And based upon my understanding that he had represented Mr. Wade dating back as far as 2015, notwithstanding the fact that the divorce proceeding wasn't filed until 2021, it's my understanding that I was concerned personally as my fraternity brother and as another member of the bar that he might arguably be running afoul of the attorney 
attorney client privilege. And so I did have wow. a conversation. Wow. Wow. Oh my goodness. This dude has the stones to show up to this proceeding and to just basically mock this proceeding. I don't even know what I'm doing here. This is ridiculous. I have no involvement in this case at all. If she's going to call me, I have no nothing to testify to about at all. And she says, yeah, you might have called him and literally he's like warning him like attorney client privilege. Like it's an implied threat. Okay. If you breach your attorney client privilege on this matter, you might lose your law license, right? You might lose your bar license. License. I'm telling you, man, these county attorneys are very, very powerful and they don't play around. Like, you know, they use their power, many of them, not all of them, corruptly. Some of them use it corruptly to put pressure on things, to, you know, go send, you know, cops just kind of do laps around your house or something, you know, they exploit their positions. This guy has the stones to come here and say he's got nothing to do with any of this. And then he's outed as literally calling to dissuade the key witness from testifying. Unbelievable. Then he admits it in open court. How dumb can you be? They just keep digging themselves into holes. It's wild. With him about that and just express my concern. Because they're fraternity and if that was a way to intimidate, if that's what he's suggesting, I mean, I would take issue with that. And in fact, we laughed and he said, we need to get together for a drink afterwards. And wild. So, but if that's what she wants to call me about is my conversation with Mr. Bradley, I'm not sure that that's relevant. Yeah, we'll sure. see in court. Okay. okay. Well, and I think that sounds like something that's just, we're going to have to see as the hearing yeah, we'll see in begins court. and what we get through as to whether it becomes relevant yeah, and wow. it becomes an issue. Cool. And so I don't think your motion would be able to be granted today. Sorry. But we'll see. You can re-raise it at the hearing if you think it's necessary. Okay. I also think, I, I would imagine you may have other, if you have other conflicts Thursday and Friday, I don't think it's necessary to have you waiting outside the courtroom for those two straight days. So we'll just put you on a two-hour call if that works. Crazy. Well, the only conflict for the court's awareness is on the 15th, I have a, to be in federal court in Macon. You going to cruise? Yeah. And so to the extent that you could get to me on one of those other days, that would be great. And, going to Aruba? And or, but I have to be in federal court in Macon, All right. 1 p.m. Well, we'll be in touch about any logistics. So as it relates to Mr. Campbell. Wow. That did not work out well for that dude. Oh my gosh. I have not seen a crash and burn like that in a while. He came here with a lot of self-assuredness. I don't even know what I'm doing. And then he just got obliterated. Unbelievable. I understand on the front uh, end, is it, the is it a similar argument? I know you've raised a similar argument to Mr. Bradley Judge and based upon the court's earlier kind of discussion and colloquy with Ms. Cross and Ms. Merchant, I'd assume that they're not trying to go into attorney-client privilege. I will just take issue. I mean, it seems not. to, Ms. Merchant's response seemed to suggest that because he wasn't counsel of record in the divorce that somehow or another, he hadn't gleaned information that was related to the attorney-client privilege. My understanding is that Mr. Campbell or Attorney Campbell joined the Wade Law Firm back in 2012. And that at or around 2015 is when, you know, the issues concerning whether or not Mr. Wade was going to get a divorce with his current wife came up and that the firm began to represent him at or around that time. And so to the extent that she's seeking to get into information concerning what he gleaned, albeit not a counsel of record, but a member of that firm, that I would submit that that would certainly be an issue that we would be seeking to avoid him testifying about. Ms. Merchant, any response? I wanted to make sure that I'm clear. There was also some allegations in Mr. Banks' petition that they were business associates. And so that I don't know if they were arguing there was some type of privilege. I can't find anything to indicate that they're business associates. And I couldn't find anything to indicate that Mr. Campbell ever represented Mr. Wade. Isn't the firm Wade and Campbell? Yeah. But if you go to the bar website, it's not. And if you go to the Secretary of State, it's not. And to further complicate matters, Mr. Campbell has a taint room conflict contract right now and has had it for the entire time Ms. Willis has been there. He is doing taint review under Garrity for Mr. Wade's anti-corruption unit. So I don't think they are partners because I think that would be problematic for them to be doing taint review of privileged material that <laughs> What is happening? They're not, okay. So, you know, when you form an LLC, you have to like list the members who are on the LLC, like, you know, member manager, like who's a part of the business, the lawyers, like these are lawyers, Wade Campbell and whatever. They don't even form their law firm with the same people on the, what the heck is going on? It's like a bunch of people who've never practiced law before. And like, they can't be partners because they have similar contracts. In other words, like if they're partners, the guy who's doing the taint team review, apparently partners with Nathan Wade and he's not supposed to be partners with Nathan Wade because he's supposed to be doing the taint review you know separate and apart from the rest of the people what is happening that is being reviewed by well I think with those red flags I think that's also worth noting that we've got two witnesses here Mr. Gosh. Bradley and Mr. Campbell where privilege issues are being waived and I think to the extent possible we could burn hours getting into these issues so I think we're going to have to be ready to address those efficiently and determining the scope and manner of the representations or save them towards later in the presentation of the evidence so Mr. Banks any initial just on that last point about is there any 
privilege as, as it relates to something related to their business association or the, is the sole focus that may come up if he's called to testify relating to the attorney-client privilege? I mean, I use the word business partner because he is, On the they, they are partners. You probably didn't know that. Time, whether they were partners way back when, when he joined the firm in 2012, I don't think that that was the case. Having said that, to the extent that he gleaned confidential information through the attorney-client privilege while being a member of that firm, I mean, it would be much like a paralegal wouldn't be able to, I mean, divulge privileged information while working ultimately with that firm. Now, that's as it concerns any information that he gleaned concerning the relationship between Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis during the pendency of the divorce proceeding. And prior to the pendency of the divorce proceeding, frankly, I don't think that the attorney-client privilege starts when someone files an entry of appearance or files a complaint for that matter, I think. Sure. All things we'll have to get through. Yeah. All right. But for today, I think there's at least that basic threshold showing of relevance where wow. we may end up having to be called at this hearing. Yeah. So See you there, Gabe. I'll defer ruling as the record develops. You can re-raise it. Okay. See you Thursday, Gabe. All right. Thank you, Mr. Banks. If there's All right. Anything. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> All right, take care. I think we still have uh, yeah, Mr. Partridge and Ms. Monroe. Off. So let me turn to that was a disaster. Uh, that guy Mr. had a bad day. On behalf of bad day. Ms. Yurdy. All right, good afternoon, Judge Durante Partridge on behalf of Ms. Yurdy. Yurdy. Yes, sir. So What's up, Durante Yurdy. Probably makes more sense to start with Ms. Merchant. Yurdy is, of course, the former employee who used to work for Fannie. On this, yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's fine. Um, Judge Ms. Yurdy owns the uh, property that Ms. Willis was staying at. She has an immense amount of knowledge that's relevant to this case about their relationship prior to Mr. Wade being appointed in this case. They've been best friends since college for 30 something years and has knowledge of the relationship. The relationship prior has knowledge of them staying in the apartment. She owns the apartment. All right, Mr. Partridge, in light of this conflict in the evidence over the relationship, what do you think the grounds would still be for Quashel at this stage? Yes, Judge, thank you so much. First and foremost, just to clear discrepancy with what Ms. Merchant just said, my client does not own the property whatsoever. She was leasing the property at the time. My partner, so is he representing his wife? And subsequently moved out of the property partner. to move into another property that she was renting as well. Well, and Ms. Willis continued to reside at the property. So my client did not know anything that was going on at the property when she moved out. So just to clear that first and foremost, Shana. Rental. It was a rental. I said owns and I'm at least. So had authority over the unit. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Partridge. Thank you, Judge. Furthermore, Yana, with regard to the situation, we called it a fishing expedition as well. That's Merely what they all say. Ms. Yardy does not have any information as it relates to that of a romantic relationship or any relationship or what took place at the property after she moved out. I've communicated that information to that of Ms. Marchant from that of Ms. Yardy. So she just has absolutely zero else to add to. Ms. Merchant, do you have anything that would impeach that testimony if that's what she testifies to at the hearing? Yes, she has personal knowledge of their relationship. And, and, and how would you impeach that? I can impeach that with Mr. Bradley, but I believe that Mr. Gertie will testify truthfully. And I believe that she will tell this court that she has knowledge of their relationship and has knowledge that Mr. Wade was staying at the apartment that Ms. Willis was staying at. Okay, Mr. Partridge, back to you. Uh, yes, Judge, I, I would disagree as it relates to the representation that Ms. Merchant made. If there's any information or testimony that Mr. Bradley has, we'd also ask the court to reserve ruling as to Ms. Gertie's involvement with regards to this particular situation to see what information so comes Bradley from Mr. Bradley. Come out and blow Otherwise, Your Honor, this would be a fishing expedition because there is no information that Ms. Merchant has stated to the court that would suggest that my client has actual knowledge of personal relate or a romantic relationship or Mr. Wade staying at the that particular residence with Ms. Willis. All right. Well, just a matter of logistics here. Are you suggesting that Mr. Bradley should be allowed to go into statements he's heard from your client before she's called? Because generally you impeach someone after they've said something that they can be impeached with, right? Yes, Judge. And I, and I understand that, Your Honor. My concern, however, is that, that we've been presenting it with there's nothing in the subpoena to Ms. Yardy that says or indicates that she has you know any information beyond that of what Mr. Bradley has said to that of Ms. Marchant, which is essentially all that we have, all that I've been put on notice about is that Mr. Bradley, you know, is the person or, or rather before today it was there's another witness, a lawyer that has something to say as it relates to that. Sure. Of so if Mr. Bradley were to testify as say the first called witness that he had had a conversation with your client without going into what it was or what the substance was, and that generally that conversation contained information about the nature and extent of the relationship, is that thing open your client up to being called? It potentially would in that situation, Your Honor, but I guess we'd have to get to that point. I'm not sure what information he would have. I've not had the opportunity to reach out to Mr. Bradley, who I know also, Judge, and so I'm not sure, but according to my conversations, repeated conversation with Ms. Yardy, there's no information as it relates to her knowledge because, again, she moved out of the condo or the residence. Okay. Judge, there's another issue, and I know we weren't focusing on that, so I didn't highlight it, but there's also this issue of the media statements, all of those types of statements. So Ms. Yardy, I think this is instructive for the court, Ms. Yardy was the person at the DA's office who actually had an account to monitor the Critical Mention media. So Ms. Willis she was the spent, media person. had a contract with a company called Critical Mention. And what they are is 
they're a media monitoring company. And remind me, is your argument just to say that that is a motivating factor in this case and is underlying her forensic comments? Oh, yes, definitely, Judge. Okay. Yes. And Ms. Yurdy is the one that actually anal like got, had those reports. There were two people that had access to it at first, and Ms. Yurdy's one of those. So she's one of the people that responded to Ms. Willis and would give her these reports and, and talk about these reports with her. But she also, I mean, the critical information is that this is her place. That sure. So understood. And um, thank you for flagging that. I think that's likely to fall solely within that box of, of things I don't think would be coming out in an evidentiary hearing in terms of the forensic misconduct, but we'll take it as it comes. All right, Mr. Partridge, thank you for joining us today. I don't believe that I can grant your motion to quash at this time. Understood, Yana. And if I may, just See, for the record, there. there was something else mentioned as well. I believe when Ms. Cross was presenting, Ms. Merchant stated that Ms. Yardy was the personal assistant and kept calendars for that of Ms. Willis. And that is also untrue, Judge, just for the record. She was a not an assistant, Your Honor. She did styling for Ms. Willis as well as some public relations work for Ms. Willis during her campaign, Your Honor. So she'll okay. know a lot about what's Understood. going on. Understood. Take care, Ms. Partridge. So Bradley has lawyered up. She just said, look, Bradley's lawyered up. And they better wrap Bradley in bubble wrap for these next three days, okay? He better be put in a padded room, stored away from everybody, because a lot of people are going to try to contact him, right? They're already trying to contact him. It'd be really a bad thing for your career, Bradley, if you did this, right? We're fraternity brothers. You know how much I care about you. You don't want to wreck your attorney-client privilege obligations, do you? Keep Bradley nice and safe up until Thursday when the hearing happens. I think that leaves us then with Ms. Monroe on behalf of the DA's office as well. Yes, Fulton, good afternoon. The Fulton County attorney. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Judge, for putting this case on uh, your motion calendar on such late notice. So the reason for our motion to quash is number one, these documents that were requested have been provided to the defendant's counsel by way of the Fulton County portal. Let's go to specifics. I'm looking at a copy of Exhibit A of the subpoena. It's got seven bullets. Which of those mm -hmm. are you contending have already been provided? So it is our, under I don't know this specifically, but it's our understanding that about a majority of the responses have been provided That's and not viewed by defendant's counsel. And if not provided directly through the portal, it has been attached to the various motions as supporting documentation in this case okay, and also readily it. available by public information. That's why you have a subpoena. We need those um, other ones. Which ones haven't been though? Because that could still be relevant Thank for you. the subpoena. Yeah. It's our understanding that Gosh. I don't have that direct information. Oh, but, well, go um, get it. That's in light what the subpoena is for. In go light get of it. the responses that have not been provided, there is no relevance for the information. We have a criminal case. These The things that, are, that they're asking for, has there's no connection. There's no relevance. And the defendant admits that. There's no reason in which these yes, documents- there is. Someone thinks it's relevant. The judge signed the subpoena. Hello. And were, there was no reason provided as to why these documents were requested. And in order for- <laughs> <laughs> subpoena to be issued in this fashion, there needs to be a material reason for the subpoena. And in this case, we do not have one. Okay. Ms. Merchant, what haven't you gotten that was on exhibit A and why is it relevant? Thank you. So I have not gotten all of the invoices from Mr. Wade. I started asking for those back in September through the open records and I got some of them piecemeal. I got a couple others that the state attached to their motion. So the open records officer said I had gotten everything and then the state attached a couple more. So now I have even more, but there's still a couple that are outstanding. Yeah. So there's several that are outstanding. And we put that in a very detailed pleading and letter to the Fulton County County attorney. We have not received a single invoice from Mr. Bradley. We do not have a current contract contract for Anna Cross or Don Floyd. And the issue with that is that Ms. Willis made statements that she paid them the same amount of money. The contracts we have for Mr. Floyd, that is an incorrect statement. Um, they were He was not paid the same amount of money. We do not have either contract, current contracts for either of those folks. We don't have anything about the time off requests. We don't have anything about the reimbursements for Ms. Willis. And we don't have anything in regards what to the last you, bullet point. What makes you think that travel reimbursements the are relevant? Because everything seemed to be personal travel. We're not sure that it's all personal travel. And I don't believe that it is. The personal, this is all evidence that is related to us showing that Ms. Willis had a personal and a financial interest in this prosecution. Reimbursements for her travel. Mr. We have some reimbursements for Mr. Wade's travel. So are those trips connected? Those were the things that we're seeking. We sought all of these through open records. These are open records, but the county has been refusing to give them to us despite way longer than three days. So before this hearing was set, we already were in litigation over the open records violation. These are things we're entitled to. We don't have to show that they're relevant in the open records context, sure. but so then we get a hearing and instead of waiting for the litigation and them to actually give us the documents for the open records, I have to get them in through a business certificate. So I can't submit an open records. I cannot submit all of these invoices. These invoices are hearsay. I need a business record certificate. I sent a subpoena to the county asking for a business record certificate. They have to certify the documents they've already given me. Plus, they've got to give me the documents that they haven't given me. Okay, let's keep making our way down the list. I can see your argument on travel and vacation since that's at the core of your allegations. The last one, though, talking about all hiring an outside counsel, that seems to go more towards what I indicated has a lot less relevance for me. Hiring an outside counsel for... Just generally, it says any outside counsel. Process for hiring bids, payment of outside counsel. Are you talking about... And I just the, want to make final, sure. the final bullet. Any and all courses. Oh, okay. I understand. I, I want to make sure because yeah. I, I got... I printed their 
years out right before I left the office. This is in regards to a board of county commissioners meeting that was held in November 2023. There was a very detailed conversation between Dexter Bonds and I can't remember her name, but she's the purchasing director for um, Fulton County. They had a very detailed discussion and said that there had been a problem with the processing of invoices with the district attorney and that they had to talk with her and go through a new rebidding training with them because essentially they were having services that weren't going through the proper channels. We believe that these documents are relevant to show the personal financial interest of the district attorney. How so? Getting things paid for without approval. Okay, so that's going more towards the approval aspect of it and the, you know, maybe county, what you would refer to as, you know, impropriety and sticking to county regs. Is that fair? Not necessarily county regs, but also sticking to the statute, which is the basis for all of this, the statute that was not followed, which right. is the basis. But also, what are these, is she having a personal financial benefit to this prosecution by yeah, submitting invoices 30, and things like that? 30000 a month. Yeah, it's all got to um, start I just want to add and just provide further clarification. It's our understanding that pursuant to the subpoena and the information that's being requested there in our possession, Fulton County Attorney's Office, all of that information has been provided. But in terms of the open requests that were submitted, the separate open requests that were submitted to the district attorney's office on a separate open records request, we wouldn't have privy, we wouldn't have personal knowledge as to what requests have been fulfilled or not. But in terms of what we have in possession in our office, we have that right. information has been provided already. Standard process by the district attorney's yeah. office. We gave them everything. So there's nothing we have. outstanding pursuant to this subpoena that we would have that they don't have access to already. Okay. So just to be I don't have anything authenticated. I haven't received one single authentication from them. And I think that's what it comes down to. She's seeking authentication. We just want to make sure that we are fulfilling our end. And if this is information that she has already received by, you know, doing use, public uh, records, using the legal process with subpoenas just to obtain authentication, it's not a proper use of the legal system, nor is it coupled with the fact there is a pending litigation, as Ms. Merchant so emphasized, pending against the district attorney's office regarding a, a potential, an alleged open records act violation. Well, how else would she authenticate it then, Ms. Monroe? Yeah, are you like, planning to come down? Uh, yeah. What are you going to do? Are you going to go have someone personally? That's your job. Testify to it? Without a subpoena? That's what I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question. Well, I mean, more to the point, it seems the, this conversation keeps shifting. It's either the county attorney does not have the items requested, or is the sole issue now just authentication of the items that she already has, the defense already has. Your Honor, may I be permitted to speak? This is Shalonda Miller. I am the designated records custodian for Fulton County. Okay. And I might be able to provide some clarification. Individuals request open records. We are not required to authenticate responses to open records requests. That's not a part of the Open Records Act. They're also not required to produce anything that we do not have in our possession, even when individuals think we do. I'll give an example there, Ms. No, Merchant. I agree with you. I don't need an example. I guess all that would remain then is what Ms. Merchant is saying that you have if records and that you haven't given all she's after is authentication and that hasn't been provided, but she thinks that a witness she, she has subpoenaed. never requested authentication, Your Honor, absent this subpoena. That all right. wasn't a request. The, the first time we saw anything about authentication was at the service of the subpoena. Okay. All right. So, Ms. Are Merchant, you, are you gonna? where does this stand then? Two things. First, that's we have to get business records certificates as we have to subpoena the witness. And if they want to avoid coming and testifying, they can submit a business records affidavit. We drew one up and submitted it with the subpoena. So I believe we followed the proper procedure to get these records certified. As far as they've given us everything they have, they have not. As far as the first bullet point, we do not have invoice number 22 or 25. It's not been attached to anybody's pleadings. It's not anywhere, any, any place. Okay, let's start there. So Ms. Monroe, is invoice 22 or 25 something that's in the possession let's of Fulton go. County? One by one. Not that we're aware of, Your Honor. Fulton County, Fulton County doesn't have an invoice for Nathan Wade. That's the custodian of records. Do you have an invoice for a, some dude you just gave 30 grand to? Do you have any financial records for that? No, we don't have it. Fulton County doesn't have it. Well, that's weird because Ashley Merchant got the others. So somebody has it. Who would typically have retained custody of those kind of things? Those invoices or reimbursement requests? Would that just stay with the district attorney or would Fulton County have all those? The district attorney and we'll follow up with our client, but it's our understanding that they provided the records they do have. I'm, I'm not sure what's <laughs> And R25 not be a part of those records, but we can confirm that all that we have in our possession has been provided. Unbelievable. So was somebody deleting the records? Like somebody has some of these invoices because Ashley Merchant has several of them. So did somebody delete them or somebody didn't enter in the $30,000 monthly payments to this dude? This whole county, man, is a disaster. And I've been asking for invoice 22 since September. It's an invoice. Okay. All right. And it's an invoice. It's not anything like wild. Like you're not asking for like the source code of your gas chromatography DUI analysis machine. Like, okay, you're going to fight over that. That's fine. But <laughs> this is an invoice. She's got the other ones. And Ms. Merchant, you were talking about, you said that the next three bullets were invoices for Mr. Bradley, contracts for Ms. Cross and Mr. Floyd. I guess turning to Ms. Monroe or Ms. Miller, are those also things that you're saying are not in the possession of Fulton County and only in the possession of the district attorney? We're not trying to delineate between the district attorney and Fulton County. What we're saying is our clients provide us those records, the records that they have in their possession. There are presumptions about what should exist and what we should have in our possession. But just because individuals think they exist doesn't mean we necessarily have them in our possession for whatever reason. Where are they? Okay. Does Fanny have Understood. them? Do you have them though? No, not that we're aware of. And we have conferred with our client and it is our understanding that everything that is in the client's possession has been provided. Okay. So as far as I can tell, they do not have invoices. 
they have missing invoices, okay? So Fulton County has you know, lost an invoice for probably twenty to $30,000, several of them. They can't find them. Okay, so then that sounds like a follow-up question to their client, the district attorney's office, if they've been under subpoena for these same documents. But for now, the person subpoenaed is saying, or the entity subpoenaed is saying they don't have them. And unless counsel has a reason to show that they do, I think that's usually the end of it. Miss Cross appeared today, I believe, under contract. She's been submitting invoices. So, I mean, maybe they just come and testify as to how they have people well, under no, contract. No, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's where is it? And have you subpoenaed the right entity or person? Um, so. Well, they have represented that they represent the district attorney. They even filed this motion to quash saying yeah, they represent on, the judge. district attorney. This is ridiculous. So, that's a very good point. So, Miss Miller, Miss Monroe, yeah. regardless of whether they're down the hall or across the street, if you are the entity where legal process has thank to go you, in order to serve the district attorney's office for yeah, production, thank you. Don't, how does that get you out of complying with the subpoena? Right. We don't have it. Oh, can't Your find Honor, it. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt and you can tell me to wait and I will gladly do it. But insofar as we're talking about a subsequent contract for me, there, there is none in existence. Do you get invoiced? Okay. In, do you get and invoiced? And that's, that's, again, I keep hearing two different things. Either it exists or it doesn't exist or someone has or doesn't have it. And do kind of flip, we keep paid? flipping back and forth between the two. And I'm trying Anna? to nail this down. Apologies, Your Honor, for being unclear. Anything that we have in our possession that our client has in its possession, we have provided. Okay. okay. There are assumptions yeah. about- And she said this like five times, right? This is the standard prosecutor's language, okay? And they get away with this crap all the time. It's in, not even in just, you know, state court, federal courts all over the place. But they say, we do not have possession of it and we can't find it. And we're not obligated to go find it. And a lot of the case law supports them because it's like, well, the government's big. They have a lot of records and you're not entitled to make them go, you know, track down all your stuff. But that is the different, you know, different here. They have asserted that they represent Fannie and she's the person who's paying these people. Whether it's a contract or not, we're talking about invoices. Anna, did you get paid? Things that we have that are inaccurate because we've provided everything that either our office or the district attorney's office has. Okay. We're not no, trying no, to hide anything. Uh, no, that makes it clear. So that, so that you're saying that you would be, either you or collectively the DA's office would be responsible for providing these if you have them. And your understanding, just again, going back to the first bullet point, is that a invoice 22 or 25 has already been provided. It may not have been provided, Your Honor, but if it hasn't been provided, it's because we don't have it in our possession. And when I say we, I'm saying a collective we, the district that's, attorney's thank office. You. Okay. Thank you. I think that's where I've been getting held up. Okay. That's said, you're, that's something you plan to follow up and confirm. We will definitely so, follow up for the, we have followed up numerous times with our client, but we will again for the purposes of the They don't have $30,000 right, And invoices. as for the remaining items, contracts wow. with Floyd, Cross, Bradley, is it the same thing that collectively you either think they've been provided or they don't exist? Correct. All right. Ms. Merchant? We would just ask that they come for, I mean, obviously they can't do a business record certificate to say something doesn't exist. So I think it just makes sense then for me to not even ask for the business record certificate and ask them to just bring the certified documents, whatever they have and testify on uh, the 15th of August. Seems the only way to figure out what exists, doesn't exist, existed. I mean, invoice 22 has been paid. Invoice 25 has been paid. Yeah, sure. So someone has them. Yeah, they're there or not. Crazy. Total incompetence. This is your government at work, by the way. Okay, so I, I think ultimately it. it's, like if we, there is something that you are being- We don't often get to see it, right? This is something that is just being exposed, thankfully, in the middle of a criminal defense case. But had Ashley Merchant and her team not cracked this whole thing open, we would have never known any of this, okay? So shout out to Ashley Merchant. We cannot say that enough. All of this would have just been covered right up and they would have just prosecuted along the way without anybody being any wiser at all. Compelled to provide that does not exist or that has already been provided and you can confirm that, then there is no obligation on your part to do anything further with the subpoena. However, it appears that in order to complete the evidentiary record, counsel needs at least some kind of testimony establishing the absence of a record or yeah. testimony authenticating records that have already been produced. And so if there's not going to be a certification to that effect, then there would need to be live testimony to that end. And so I don't think that an outright quashel is what happens with Go get the this records. motion or Fulton County. Understood, Your Honor. If there are other particulars that come up between now and Thursday and you think you want more guidance or clarification, we, we can take it up. Thank wow. You. Thank okay. you. Wow. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Shot. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Wow. All right. So. All right. Are there any other? I think we got through them all. Yeah. No, Judge. Uh, anything else? Or anyone else here who anticipated needing to address before Ms. Cross? Anything else? Just a minor logistical point, Your Honor. At any evidentiary hearing on Thursday, we would ask the court's permission to have a witness who's out of state testify remotely. All right. Can you identify that witness? Yes. It's the district attorney's father. His name is Mr. Floyd. He's in California. All right. Ms. Merchant, is that something you're prepared to address at the moment? Um, if I can speak with him ahead of time, then I can very Fanny's likely dead. to agree and not object to that and waive the notice. They're getting Papa Fanny to come in. He's a little unwell, so he's going to zoom in. That we're All right. But I just ask that I be able to speak to him ahead of time. Okay, and Ms. Cross, is that solely for logistical reasons or are there other perhaps medical concerns or other things that might compel remote testimony? There are medical conditions, as I'm aware, none that affect the witness's ability to appear. But I believe there are some medical issues involved in addition to the out-of-state travel. Okay, understood. I'll let you and Ms. Merchant take that up and you Thank can you. let me know if that's something we still need to address before Thursday. As I mentioned, we've set aside all day Thursday. We've also set aside Friday and we'll see if further time is required depending on where the hearing takes us in terms of logistics. We got two full days? No, a number of defense counsel have adopted the motion and joined it. Many of them are with us today. Ms. Merchant, have you had any conversations with counsel as to how they how you would proceed? Are they all planning to have you 
as their flag bearer? Are they all, when it comes to arguments, when it comes to direct or cross-examination? I haven't had that specific question. I think that I'm probably going to be leading it, but I'm not sure. They filed a little bit different motions. Some of them had some different allegations. So yeah, we want you issues. to lead it, actually. Um, as far as that, I did have one housekeeping matter, though. Mr. Wade has not accepted service of our subpoena. The state raised that in their motion. Since he has a lawyer, I reached out to Mr. Evans, his lawyer, um, and asked him if he would accept it on his behalf. I didn't want my process server to have to follow him around. I hate having lawyers do that, but I just need some direction if he's going to accept the subpoena or if I Perfect. need to have him staked out. So Go there's an alternative him. means of services. They're not, you can serve as counsel of record? Yes, Go get him, I can Ashley. serve it. Well, in civil, I can. They, they raised an objection in Ms. Cross's motion to the service that I'd sent by certified mail, and he keeps refusing that service. So the alternative would be for me to either serve his attorney with permission of his attorney, Mr. Evans, or... I don't even know if it requires his permission. If you don't have the statute handy at the moment, maybe someone else can pull it up, but it's about two code sections following Quashel. So 24, 13, 25, you can pull that for me. I mean, if he's accepting service, then it would obviously be easy, but I, I don't know if he is. But what I'm curious about here is if it matters whether his attorney is accepting or if you just send it to a certified address, if that's sufficient. The law says if we send it certified, that that is sufficient. I know that the statute actually did print that statute out. He's refusing service though. So I think that they could raise that because they raised it in their brief. They're raising that it wasn't. Well, if the lead counsel in this case is refusing service, I'll entertain a motion for a continuance until he can be properly served. Okay, thank you, Judge. Your Honor, before we go, can I correct something? I misspoke when I said that Mr. Floyd had medical problems that might prevent his travel. That's not the case. It's just his location in California that would require the remote participation with the court's permission. All right. Thank you, Ms. Cross. Good to correct the record. Anything else, Ms. Merchant, you said is, is housekeeping? Mr. Gillen said he is going to be presenting a summary witness, but that's it as far as other, just for housekeeping. A summary witness, hopefully to summarize all of the financial records so it's a little bit easier. For okay. Thank you. All right. So again, I would ask you to confer with counsel to confirm whether everyone's expecting to do their own argument. If so, we're going to have some time limits. If other people are presenting their own witnesses, I haven't heard of any because I haven't gotten any other motions to quash. And whether folks are combining their ability to cross. I think if they've joined the motion, they have the right to present their own evidence. I think I can limit argument to some extent. And again, I can very much, as we get through cross, if a question's already been asked, I don't really care who's asked it. And we'll streamline things that way. I think someone from the gallery wanted to be heard. Yes, from the gallery, Your Honor. If you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, Steve Sadow, counsel for President Trump. Oh! Uh, when you're finished, I have a unrelated matter I'd like to take up with the court outside everyone else's uh, involvement. And is this ex parte? It would be ex parte, yes, sir. All right. Anything else? Interesting. Okay, so that was Trump's lawyer, Steve Sadow. And he was in court behind the bar as a lawyer, right? Sitting back there watching all this stuff. Says, Judge, I need to talk to you after the fact, ex parte, which means I'm not talking to the prosecutor. I just need to address something with you, Judge, alone, right? Separate and apart from anybody. So Trump's attorney was there watching this whole thing unfold and they're wrapping up. If not, we'll be off the record. Thank you. All right, that's it. All rise. Oh, get up. All right, all rise. All right, Judge is here. Judge is leaving. All right, all right. We're off the record, man. That was a motions hearing out of Fulton County to disqualify Fannie Willis. Of course, the hearing is coming up. That was a subpoena hearing to see if they could quash those subpoenas so that Fannie did not have to testify. And she still may not. She still may, you know, squeak out of this thing, but we'll see because they're bringing in Terrence Bradley and Bradley is going to blow the lid off this whole thing when he comes in to testify. And it is going to be spicy. I want to say that Ashley Merchant is an absolute phenom. Oh my goodness. That was some incredible lawyering. She had a full handle on the whole proceeding from beginning to end. Okay, every one of those other lawyers who came back out, they just had small little clients, you know, one at a time. They had one issue to hop up on and she beat them all up badly, right? And they embarrassed themselves. They even came out full of their ego and their bravado and they said, there's no reason for me to be here. And she said this and this and this. And didn't you call him and didn't you tell him not to testify? That's a problem. My goodness. That was one of the most insane hearings I think we've ever covered here. And what happens on Thursday is probably going to be even more insane. So I hope that you join us as we cover it, my friends. We're planning on covering that thing top to bottom. So hopefully you subscribe and join us as we do. We're covering all the Trump cases here. We're covering what's happening in Florida classified documents case, the January 6th saga. We're covering it all. The ballot removal nonsense from the Supreme Court, the immunity decision that's going up to the Supreme Court probably soon and more. And so hopefully you join us as we continue to expose all of this. They're exposing themselves and they just keep digging themselves deeper into a hole. And this couldn't be better for the entire lawfare defense, right? All of the Trump litigation is now, I think, going to be in many ways over, I would say, subsumed, right? Or overshadowed, rather, by this case. Fannie Willis is going to become like the lightning rod, right? The albatross that hangs around the, the neck of the lawfare prosecutors because this is symbolic of everything else that we're seeing. They are just so bad at their jobs that they turn this into a giant explosion for all of us to see. But this same pattern, right? This same type of corruption is evident throughout our government and throughout the Trump prosecutions. And she's just making it easy for us to see. It's all now crystallizing right in front of our eyes. And this hearing is not going to go well for them. In fact, a part of me thinks that if it wasn't
wasn't Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade, two people I think are untouchable given their act and their penchant for going on cruises once a month for multiple months on end. They have so much, I think, ego and bravado that they'll probably try to survive this thing. But I would not be surprised at all if we wake up and one of them has resigned, honestly, because this is going to be bad. It's going to be so bad and they are not going to want the spillover to impact, you know, the rest of their cases. And think about this, my friends. Like, yes, this is about the Trump case, but the reason district attorneys are so insulated and so protected is because what happens if this impacts all of their cases? Okay, what happens if like this just, like right now we're focused on Trump and Michael Roman and Ashley Merchant and everything that they've been able to expose. But what if there's other corruption? And what if they have to start dumping out thousands of criminal cases, right? If the entire Fulton County office is now slowly crumbling and think about all of that capital that's been invested into thousands of criminal cases that are all working their way through the system right now. Okay, what if Fannie Willis had some other corruption that gets exposed? And so when things like this happen, when the institution is under threat by justice, actual justice, you start to see corruption compound on corruption. You start to see people lying by filing affidavits. You see other people making phone calls like that Gabe dude. Hey, just want to remind you that you could be in trouble. Okay, they all start to circle the wagons to protect themselves. And this is like a free for all defense attorneys in Fulton County, defense attorneys in Atlanta. It's like they just went to Disneyland. Okay. Or maybe, you know, when Disneyland used to be something that people wanted to go to before they were talking about what they're talking about. It's like an exciting event because this is so much energy strapped around such an important case that they're going to be making probably their careers off this case. And so we cannot wait to cover this. It is going to be so much fun. I hope that you subscribe, my friends. Thank you for also checking out some of the other things that we work on here. Links in the description below. But my friends, we're going to be here continuing to cover. Thank you for joining us as we do. And we'll look forward to seeing you right back here on the next one.